Hello everyone, my name is Brent Colby from Southeastern University and today we'll be taking a look at an aspect of social foundations of organizations. Feel free to contact me at brentcolby.com if you have any questions or would like to follow up with any of the things we'll be discussing here. Let's begin with a bit of a quote from a gentleman named Robert Reichs in 1874 and he recalls a story of a conversation he was having with a woman on the side of the street in the neighborhood where he lived. Ah, sir, the woman to whom I was speaking, could you take the view of this part of town on Sunday? You would be shocked indeed, for then the street is filled with multitudes of those wretches who come on release of the day of employment, spend their time in noise and riot, playing at chuck and cursing and swearing in a manner so horrid as to convey, as to any serious-minded, an idea of hell rather than of any other place. This is the world that Robert Reichs lived in in the 18th century, and this is where we will be going to evaluate a major historical movement in education, the Sunday School Revolution. Robert Reichs was born in 1736 in Gloucester, England. He was a husband and father of 10 children. He inherited the family business of publishing a magazine in a town, and he was involved in a variety of social clauses, including jail reform and what he's most popularly known for, the, uh, the Sunday School Revolution, as many people call it. He was a Christian leader and businessman, not a clergyman, as many people think. He is the founder of the modern Sunday school movement and had a profound role in the development of both Christian and public education. The impact of his programs across England and the world have elevated the social, moral, and economic standing of generations of men and women. And this presentation will explore primary and secondary sources to reveal three concepts that Reichs popularized in the late 18th and early 19th century. We're going to take a look at three primary influences of Robert Reichs, and these include the prioritization of children in education, the importance of education in social reform, and the impact of curriculum-based education. The prioritization of children. It's important to note that Robert Reichs both saw and reached out to the children of his community at the time. So what exactly does it mean to prioritize children? Well, in the context in which, we're, in which uh, our narrative takes place here, we see that Reichs encountered impoverished children and really wanted to help them. That quote that we opened up with is uh, a story that he tells of when he first realized that the kids in his neighborhood really had nothing to do on Sunday. This is a time when children worked six days of the week, and on the seventh day, the day of rest, they would just be a particular nuisance. But... Reich saw more than just a nuisance. He saw an opportunity to reach out to a generation of people who really needed help. He sought to reform a generation before they became a lost cause. And I believe a lot of Reich's work in the local prisons helped kind of form this idea of reaching people while they were still reachable. He created environments for unwanted children to belong and learn. Of course, parochial schools were a staple of the time, but Reichs wanted to do more than just reach out to kids who had the means for an education. He wanted all children to have access to learning. And he took these kids, who no one else wanted, and made it something valuable. He really elevated the role of children in society in a time where they were not highly respected or highly valued. John Bright was a famous politician and a renowned orator, and this is what he had to say about the works of Reichs and his followers. Give us the young people. You then give us the future of the church. You then give us the social and public life. You then give us not only the children as they are now, but men and women of future years. You give into our hands to mold and to guide even the great nation of which we are a part. 
This is in 1889, so near the peak of Reich's work and his influence in the community um, in his contemporary setting. And it was really clear that um, everybody in the social chain recognized the value and importance of what Reichs was doing, not only for the immediate needs of the communities in which he operated, but the needs of a country for generations and generations to come. And little did they know that our very systems of education today would be profoundly influenced by this as well. A second area of influence that Robert Reichs has had is on education and social justice. And he really understood the transformational power that learning has on an individual. A contemporary of the time observed, the lower classes, the vulgar, and the common people were made to keep their distance and to feel that they were of another race, even by those who wished them well. The social divide between the affluent areas of society and the poor areas was very great. England was suffering some unintended consequences of the industrial revolution of the industrial revolution, excuse me, and urbanization. And Reich wanted to help elevate people from feeling isolated or desolate. And he thought that by elevating the mind, he could also help elevate the body and ultimately the environment of an individual. He thought that nobody was incapable of improvement. Uh, we have to remember he was a businessman who was very socially aware. And before working with the education of children, as we previously mentioned, Reichs engaged in social reform at the local Gloucester jail. He was very invested into the embitterment of individuals, not just on an individual basis, though that was his, I believe, his primary focus. But he saw the societal impact of his work as well and thought it was of the utmost importance. Reichs saw their need firsthand, and we have a quote from Reichs himself here from 1794, where he observes that from being idle, ungovernable, profligate, and filthy in the extreme, they say that the boys and girls are becoming not only clean and decent in their appearance, but are greatly humanized in their manners, more orderly, tractable, attentive to business, and of course, more serviceable, expected to find them. So we see here, he sees the kids not just learning facts and figures and being able to spell and read, but changing every aspect of their life. The third observation we're going to make here often goes underemphasized when people discuss the impact and legacy of Robert Reichs, and that is of curriculum based education. He really didn't just come up with a good idea. He came up with a system of a good idea and was able to implement it in a pretty amazing way. As an example, we see the reach of Sunday school in Robert Reich's times. We have statistics that indicate that 3.3 million children enrolled in an Anglican Sunday school class, while 2.7 children enrolled in other Sunday school classes, which accounts for 75% of children in England and Wales being enrolled in one of these Sunday school programs. So you can see both the scope and the reach of Reich's work was just remarkable for any time and age, but particularly in a time and age where the dissemination of information and systems like this was not as easy as it might be for us today. And here we see Henry Harris uh, appropriately observing that the triumph of Sunday schools as a system apart from Robert Reich's, is the triumph of the newspaper press. And we see that the, the publication and dissemination of uh, printed material was a key aspect of this movement. So the question remains, what can we learn? What sort of application is there for leaders here in the 21st century when it comes to either Christian education or public education? I think any of us would be very pleased to see the same types of results that Reichs had. And I think that 
when we examine some of these influences that he had over his culture over 200 years ago, we can see some things that would be important for us to observe and apply in our world today. Another thing that often goes unnoted in Reich's story is the opposition he faced. Um, and we have the example of, of Reverend Thomas Burns from 1798 who said the following, My great objection to Sunday schools is that I am afraid they will, in the end, destroy all family religion. And whatever has the tendency to do this, I consider it my duty to guard you against. Uh, we see a pastor here who thought that this innovation was going to undermine the very structures that he accepted as being, well, they were normative at the time. The church was the instructor, the pastor, the family unit, um, but they didn't really have a model to address those who were outside of that system. Well, people felt threatened by what Reichs was doing. He could undermine their normal. Um, and we need to remember not to let resistance to our innovation stop us from pursuing whatever calling we have. And it's also interesting to note that Reichs developed his model for three full years before introducing it to the world. He had people urging him to get it out there, but he really wanted to make sure that he was addressing some of the types of concerns that Reverend Burns here brought to the table. Um, even uh, John Wesley couldn't ignore what was taking place in, in 1784. So uh, 14 years before Reverend Burns here, he made this comment. He said, I find these schools springing up wherever I go. Perhaps God may have a deeper end therein that men are aware of. Who knows? But some of these schools may become nurseries for Christians. So you can see even the somewhat skeptical John Wesley was being convinced of the great work that Reichs and his team were up to. We read in scripture how Jesus demonstrates the value of children in Mark chapter 10, and he welcomed them into his presence. And he also showed us the value of the acceptance of the gospel when he explained to his disciples and people who were listening to his teaching that they must learn how to think and reason like a child in order to fully accept who Jesus is. We see this commemorative coin um, remembering Robert Reichs, and on the back, of course, we see uh, the portion of scripture quoted there where Jesus says, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And we're just reminded of how important kids were to Christ and that we too should value kids in the way that Jesus did. Another famous portion of scripture is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, where God instructs the people. And he says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. And the author there continues to record the different ways and times that we're to impress them on our kids. In the morning, in the evening, when we're traveling, you know, he says, bind it on your foreheads. Make it a part of you. But make it so, and, and just literally in front of your face at all times. And we must remember that the education of our children belongs to us. And we mustn't hesitate to do what God has commanded us to do. And it has the power to transform a generation and, of course, to change a world. Reichs really did something remarkable by uh, instigating, by initiating, installing a series of Sunday schools. Um, he was just meeting a need that he saw in front of him, and he found a way to educate children at a time where education was expensive and it wasn't wasted on kids, but he did it anyways. And he really uh, launched a movement that has had a profound impact on our culture and society today. And of course, in many ways, pioneered what would become the public school model of education for kids to this very day. And John Bright, the politician and order we referenced earlier, made a very great observation. And we'll end with this today. He says, I think the influence of a good man or a good woman teaching 10 to 12 children in a class is an influence for the world and for the world to come that no man can measure and the responsibility of which no man can calculate. Well, thanks for listening to some of my thoughts about Robert Reichs and the impact that he has had on both Christian and public education. Um, here I have uh, included uh, some of the sources I used for the research 
And uh, if you're interested in any of these, or if you'd like to contact me, uh, feel free to visit me at brentcolby.com, and I'd be happy to respond uh, to any questions or thoughts that you might have. Thank you very much for listening.